This is the first of three lectures involved with translation. So I want to uh, talk about how the ribosomes do their job. Many of you probably have already taken this in introductory biology, but uh, here's a familiar site somewhat. We've got ourselves a ribosome. We've got a messenger RNA along here. The problem with this figure, in, in a way, I did get it from a uh, free source, uh, it's, it's showing things going, you know, from right to left. So the ribosome is actually moving uh, towards the left-hand side of the screen, which is uh, a little um, different from how we often view it. Uh, here's a transfer RNA coming in, and there's a, um, an amino acid attached to the end of this transfer RNA. I'll show more detail of this in a minute. And we can see that the uh, transfer RNA comes into the A site with its payload of a, a particular amino acid, and the anticodon of the transfer RNA will bind up with the triplet codon in the messenger RNA. So there's codon, anticodon uh, matching. You can see that happening right here. We will take the um, entire polypeptide, which, which is once attached to this ribosome, remove it, plop it onto the, the new amino acid here in the A site, and then the whole ribosome translocates exactly three nucleotides in order to shift along. There's GTP energy involved in this. Some instructors care about the details. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't go into that with my class. Uh, and then the uncharged transfer RNA is ejected through what is called the E site, the exit site, which is not shown on this uh, figure. Um, this will always happen in the cytoplasm, no matter which type of a, an organism you are, be a, a prokaryote or a eukaryote. Um, although mitochondria also have their own ribosomes as well, but I guess that's a different issue altogether. Here we can see the messenger RNA being moved. The five prime end would be right here. The three prime end would be over here, and the ribosome is going to move from five prime to three prime. We're going to have our anticodon matching up with the codon, and the amino acids come in, and we're going to uh, take this lysine, glue it onto the aspartic acid, then shift the whole thing over and eject the spent uh, tRNA. Uh, the new tRNA comes into the A site, matching its anticodon here with this codon right here. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, I think it's very important to remember the uh, central dogma, as it's often called, that the DNA will replicate using DNA polymerase. So that takes a DNA template to make more DNA and that the information uh, from the double-stranded DNA can be used to manufacture a single strand of RNA. So one of these two strands is a template for RNA polymerase to make a ribonucleotide uh, strand. And uh, this is then read by the ribosomes to link the amino acids together to make the protein. So that's, um, that's important. Um, what I want to point out is that the actual start codon, if this is an mRNA, so not all RNA is mRNA, uh, there's an, an AUG start codon. There are other start codons as well, but let's just pretend that's the only one that works. And so we actually have a region right here called the 5' prime untranslated region, like that. Uh, there's also a stop codon. So UAG is an example of one of those. And so from that point on, we're going to have our three prime untranslated region. So in front and behind the mRNA, we have regions. Now I'm going to talk about this part here in particular. Uh, this part um, helps the ribosome load on and bind. And we'll talk about the details of that uh, in a moment. Here's what a ribosome looks like. I love this picture. I got this one online. Uh, we can see that there are protein elements involved with this, but there's also ribosomal RNA involved with this as well. Uh, we can see uh, the proteins folding and bending and, and contributing to the aggregate. Uh, and so I want everyone to know that the ribosome is a machine. It's like an enzyme, but the catalytic parts of a ribosome are actually uh, the ribosomal RNA. So it's actually a ribozyme, not an enzyme, that does the peptidyl transferase activity. The term peptidyl transferase is a fancy word for saying that we create a, a peptide bond between two amino acids, which is really what translation's all about. Um, here we can see sort of a rogues gallery of all the different types of proteins that are involved. And we know the proteins because they've got alpha helix structures and beta pleated sheets in these structures. Uh, these are all little bits that contribute to the overall three-dimensional shape of the ribosome and give it the catalytic function. So this large subunit and this small subunit both are 
aggregates of nucleic acid and protein together to give it catalytic activity. Uh, here we've got the e, e, P, and A sites in here, and this ribosome would be moving towards the right hand side because the new amino acids come into the A site. The P site holds the polypeptide chain, and we transfer that over and, and shift the whole thing over in translocation. So I do, I do like this picture quite, quite, quite well. So in order to get started, there are several things that happen. As I mentioned, there's this five prime untranslated region right here, and that helps guide the small subunit of the ribosome to lock on. So that's the part of the pre-initiation complex. There's also a bunch of proteins involved with this, but I'm going to ignore those uh, for my course. Uh, your instructors might, might want you to know those. Um, so this small subunit loads on. There's a piece of uh, ribosomal RNA that's complementary to a region up here that allow it to load properly, and I'll speak more on that in a moment. Um, so uh, here we can see this region, this start codon right here, the five prime untranslated region. I just put ends for nucleotides. And then we have this consensus sequence right here. This is called the Shine Delgarno sequence, and that's only found on messenger RNA. And its job is to interact with the small subunits uh, ribosomal RNA, specifically the 16S um, small. Uh, 16S uh, uh, ribosomal RNA of the small subunit, and you can see how we'd have base pairs occurring with this anti-parallel configuration. So that's what loads the small subunit onto the messenger RNA. Uh, from that point on, you can bring in a methionine. In the case of prokaryotes, it would be formulated methionine, uh, F-met it's often called, so it's a, a special kind of transfer RNA for the very first amino acid, which is always uh, methionine, and the anticodon of the transfer RNA will pair up with the codon on the, on the um, messenger RNA. Uh, from this point on, we allow the large subunit to settle down over the top. This is not to scale, but it works well enough for us. And we can see we have an empty A site for the next amino, or for the next amino acid to be brought in place by the transfer RNA that would carry it along with it. And, you know, so then we could slide the ribosome over to the right. Now here's a, a bunch of um, Shine Delgarno sequences we can see in a variety of uh, messenger RNAs. Uh, most of these, uh, all of these coming from, um, well, pro prokaryotes here, E. coli, and also phage uh, viruses have these as well because ribosomes are required to read the mRNA to make the proper polypeptide chain. And I've lined up the start codons all here so you can see how they fit together. Um, now, in the case of translation, we often can create a situation called polyribosomes. And what we have is this mRNA, it's zipping back and forth, it's twisted inside here, and there's a ribosome, and there's a ribosome, and there's a ribosome, and there's a ribosome. We've got the small subunit in yellow and the large subunit in sort of in gray. And we can see the protein being extruded uh, 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 from the ends of these things. So, so the proteins actually spool out of the ribosome as it translates the messenger RNA into message. So this polyribosome situation shows us that one messenger RNA can be used over and over again, sometimes simultaneously, by the proteins. Now, the closer you are to the five prime end, and I'm going to say this is the five prime. No, I'm going to say this is the five prime end because you can see we have a short protein here. We'd have an identical protein. They're actually showing them in yellow and green, or pardon me, red and green for alternating uh, proteins that are created. This looks a little shorter than this one, which is a little shorter than this, and this is a really long protein here. So that means we're uh, headed towards the um, messenger RNA's three prime end by the time we get there. So the five prime end would be there based on the sizes of these proteins that are coming out of the ribosomes. Uh, as we move along. Remember that the structure of a protein is a bunch of amino acids all held together. Uh, I think everyone should be able to draw a stereotypical amino acid. So there's an amino group, central carbon with an R group, some kind of variable group here, and then a carboxyl group would go right here. And we would create a bond to the next amino acid, kind of like this. It's on carboxyl. I'll charge it. And then we have another R. I'll call it R prime. And so we do dehydration synthesis, removing those, uh, hy that hydrogen and that hydroxyl make a, a bond between it. And so this is the end of the polypeptide that sticks out. So the next amino acid goes in here. So I, if I can see a loose end right here, I'd say that that would be the N terminus. That'd be the very first amino acid there, and it would probably be methionine right there. And then I don't know what the next ones would be, but we can see the, the 
secondary structure kind of forming. I think I can see a little spiral there, and then all the other higher levels of structure that you heard about in your other um, uh, biology courses would apply. Uh, here's a picture of polyribosomes. Oops, my writing is all in there. I, I don't think I can erase it. Sadly, no. No. Nope. Um, but you can see that they do fit together in a very nice, nice fashion, as we saw uh, in that picture. Um, what do you need to know about translation and transcription? Well, bacteria have only cytoplasm. They don't have a nucleus. Therefore, uh, the transcription and tra translation all occurs in the cytoplasm. Whereas eukaryotes has uh, transcription that occurs in the nucleus. And so does RNA processing, as we found out from before. And then, of course, in the cytoplasm is where we're going to have translation. Translation, nice blocky letters. Uh, and that's cytoplasm, where the ribosomes are. It's done by ribosomes. It's a very interesting font I've designed here. Hmm. Um, so keep in mind that because we have spatial separation in eukaryotes, that means there are certain um, rules. I don't know why my lines aren't forming. Spatial tr uh, separation there. It turns out we can do simultaneous transcription and translation. So uh, let's uh, throw, can I do another pen color fairly easily? I'll do some blue DNA and I'll do a nice double helix like this. And I'll do another one just slightly offset, okay. And I'm, there's my... Uh, um, transcription bubble, and let's do a green RNA coming out of there. All right, so I'm building an RNA. It's based on the template strand. Let's say it's you know this this piece right here. Um, my five prime end would be sticking out here, and even as I'm transcribing, I want to do brown. No, we'll do a red ribosome. Small subunit, large subunit protein being made, this ribosome can actually move along the mRNA even as it's being built, uh, even as the RNA polymerase is making it. So simultaneous transcription and translation is possible only in bacteria. Um, now, one thing that bacteria do that, pro that eukaryotes don't do is they can make polycystronic mRNA. So when we do polycystronic, uh, here's my mRNA, there's my three prime end right here. Remember from the last chapter that we uh, don't have a methyl G cap or anything. Um, we'd have our Shine Delgarno sequence here. I should also mention too, the Shine Delgarno is a prokaryote thing. Eukaryotes have something called the Kozak sequence, which actually has the start quote on it sort of embedded right into it, and I haven't really talked about that. Um, anyway, we've got our start quote on here, A U G, and it would go, go and go and go, and then it would have some kind of stop quote on. So there's a little button on the side of my pen. And then two or three nucleotides later, you can have another start code on, like this. And so on and so, on, so forth. I'll just write X for stop, another start here, da, 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 and an X for stop. So a ribosome can bind on here, start making a polypeptide, you know, and it'll create a particular structure. And that same ribosome will then cruise through the next reading frame and the next reading frame so we can make a second protein of a different function, different shape, different amino acid composition. And we can make a third one. Let's put an alpha helix on it like this. So we can actually take one mRNA and have multiple reading frames. That's where the poly comes from for polycystronic. So we have three possibilities for uh, or in this case, we have three different proteins we can make from one mRNA. This is only found in prokaryotes. That is not a situation where we see in eukaryotes. So I'm going to go euk, not in eukaryotes. You, this is really, really going to be important for the LAC operon. We'll look at the LAC operon uh, in a different chapter. And I'll leave it for that and give you the genetic code in a separate um, exercise.